it exists. The fact that public education or public school, compulsory schooling exists, that's the problem right there. It's not what's going wrong in the system, it's that the system exists. I mean, it, it was instituted in 1850 as a socializing agent. Um, the, it was modeled after the Prussian system, and the whole purpose of it is to create a docile factory mine military workforce. Um, the whole purpose is to subordinate children and get them in that mindset of being subordinated so they grow up to be subordinated adults. Um, it's interesting because in the early days reading was discouraged because it obviously reading leads to free thinking individuals. So although um, probably a lot of school teachers nowadays do not realize that that's that grim reality of what public school was about, they're still perpetuating it without realizing it. The problem is, is that the public school system literally destroys children, and I am using that word not lightly, it destroys children intellectually, creatively, spiritually, even physically and emotionally, in, so, in, in a holistic manner, the child is damaged by the system. Because the entire system is designed to regiment a large group of people and to get them all to do the exact same thing, and to do it on a bell or a whistle or somebody's order. It's not for the happiness of the child. It's not to create an educated group of people. That's what they say because they're trying to conv convince the populace of that. So they're not going to go around and say, we're trying to create a docile populace here. They say, we want to educate your children so that they will help us, you know, create innovative, uh, an innovative society because, you know, capitalism is this or that. But the reality is, they're tr you know, they want children to take their place in society be cogs and keep this system going, this, this system of, of materialism, capitalism. They want you to take your place. So you're going to school to take your place. You're not there for your joy. You know, that, that's the beauty of unschooling is that, uh, you know, individual parents are doing it because we love our children, because we're, we're concerned with their happiness in the future, not whether they're going to take their place and move our society into the 22nd century by being innovative so that we can beat out Japan and, and China. You know, we're, we're doing it uh, because we love our children. So that's the problem. It exists. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes it, you know, it's funny that you say that, Jeremy, because the reality is, is that Unschooling is not radical. It's the way nature intended. It's 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 really what it's it's what all mammals do. It's all, what all animals do. When 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 you know when when we uh, in ancient times when we were born, we came into the world. We 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 just lived. We lived and learned, and and the two weren't separated. Living and learning are the exact same things. There when it's it's this idea of separating them that it's almost like saying we're separating breathing from living. It's ridiculous. So it's radical though now in our mainstream culture because it, freedom's radical. And I don't mean the freedom of the Republicans where they go and they're saying freedom isn't free and all this stuff because to them freedom means going out and gunning down people and stuff. But that's not what I'm talking about it, you know, in a political sense because I, this isn't a political thing. I don't care what spectrum you come from politically. This is not political. This is the way nature intended. So it's radical because our mainstream is so used to, from utero to grave, us being stifled, controlled, regimented, told what to do, being in a box, being in a system. So this idea of, oh my God, children not going to school, oh my gosh, children not having a curriculum, oh my gosh, children playing, oh my gosh, children being happy and, and being in joyful conditions or feeling joy, that's radical. It shouldn't be radical, though, because in, in real life, in, in, in the system of our, our history of our universe and our ecosystem, for all of the animals living on this planet, it's not radical. It's just life. But we've created such a disconnected, homogenized, and plastic society that we're considering what's natural to be radical. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically what it is from, you know, if you're explaining it to a mainstream person, basically radical unschooling is allowing your child the freedom and the joy to explore their own passions and interests in their own way um, because they're innately motivated. My son is, is, is absolutely lives and breathes and his blood pumps for music. So 
if if he was in a public school and they're telling him to do this, uh, you know, what is the, you know, tell us about what happened in 1781 in such and such a time and such and such a country with a such and such a person, that's going to literally, that's going to just, you know, it's just going to melt. Um, you know, I'm motivated by writing. My passion is writing and, and, and art and speaking. So when I was asked to sit down and, and, and shut up and be quiet and maybe um, write a haiku based on some stupid question somebody asked about wood ducks, I'm telling you, my brain never shut down so fast as, as when I was told to do something that had nothing to do, it had no relevance. So radical unschooling is relevant to the child individually, it's relevant to the family, it's relevant to that human being and what they were wired to do, what they came to this planet spiritually, neurologically to do. And, and it has nothing to do with religion. This is, this is just their innate, you know, what is, the, what is that electricity in them pumping through them want them to do what what is it that is their blueprint for living it, al it allows it to unhappen and, and to, to happen and i feel that um unschooling and attachment parenting are the exact same thing and i believe that um the two are interchangeable and they're in they're, they're, they're just they're they're not they're not philosophies it's just the way mammals live My, my son Bryson is 17. Um, he's a um, very passionate musician. He's, he's brilliant. He's very gifted. He's articulate. Um, <coughs> he's a, he, he, loves to, he loves to compose music and write his own lyrics and, and, and basically with the motivation of, of sending a world message. Um, when my son was 10 years old, I started the process of adopting him. Um, I adopted him. Um, and from the foster care system. So he had been in those systems. He had been in public school. He had been in multiple systems. So he, he did live that regimented lifestyle where he had literally, he was powerless, completely powerless. He had no decision-making power at all in his life. He was just literally ushered through his life by what other people did to him or, or set up for him. And so when, when, when I adopted him, he, he, uh, we actually met right when he turned 11. And um, he came to live with me two weeks later. Our anniversary is January 19th, 2005. And so what we did was, um, you know, I obviously wanted to unschool him from the start. But um, I, I'm a single mom. So I knew I had to work some things out at my day job that I was, you know, that I've been working so that I would have childcare available um, when I was at work uh, for him. Because obviously I can't leave an 11-year-old alone. So what I did was I worked that out, and by the time he was 12, we were all set. And so when he, literally right after his 12th birthday, we got started. I think it was like a week or so after that. So we've been unschooling ever since he was 12. And it's been a journey, because in the beginning, I had to detox my own thing. I mean, I had been researching attachment parenting and unschooling for years, and I knew about it. But even still, I'm still so indoctrinated in my own systems that I remember it was <clears throat> I remember that it was important for me to be able to realize that wow what I'm doing now is still kind of schoolish so I had to de-school myself he's been my biggest teacher my son has been my biggest unschool teacher if if you can imagine those two being together they're oxymorons but he really has because when he was struggling against doing something that the state was requiring, because we do have to meet state requirements, so there were certain things that he would be required to do. And I might be, you know, kind of really pushing that, because I was like, we got to get this in the portfolio. I realized that, you know what, there's an easier way to go about this. I, 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 we've got to just be more creative about doing this. So over time, we became more and more radical about the unschooling. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, you, you know, you just want to be done with it. And we've fought with the legislator. We've gone, we've gone to the state house and tried to help push so that uh, you know homeschoolers in general have more rights to be able to, to, to not have to um, report curriculum and not have to do a te standardized testing. We only have to show a portfolio, but we're still expected to show certain things. Um, so Bryson is an incredibly free-spirited child. Bryson, Bryson. Um, 
he dances to his own drum. And so when you try to impose something upon him, it, it's just, it, it just literally, it just grates against his spirit. He, it's, it's just like, it, it's just like uh, a blade against gravel. And um, he really needs to be able to, to follow his own path. He really needs to do his own thing. And so unschooling has allowed him to be able to explore all these creative passions he has, like for writing and for music and, and you know, just the arts in general are the center of our lives. And then to be able to explore these friendships and do all these little inventions he does. He loves to invent games and he's incredibly detailed about how he invents the games. And you know what? The most important part of radically unschooling my son is just our connection, the strength of our connection. The, the parent-child attachment is absolutely paramount. Our family, friends, that's what's paramount to unschooling. So when I talk about Bryson, you know, unschooling is a part of him because that's what, you know, allows him to be. And, and then the times where, you know, because of his issues from his past that we have had breaks in, in our unschooling because we've had to deal with some issues from that, it's it, everything's just fallen right out of place, mm -hmm. you know. I've been I've been about unschooling from the beginning before he, Bryson even um, came to me um, because I you know I've been researching it for so long. I mean I've been researching un, unschooling attachment parenting for quite some time, so I knew exactly what I wanted to do when my son came. However. Um, because the state had certain requirements, and in fact, the first year we homeschooled, um, which by what they call homeschool, but the first year we unschooled, um, the state actually had a different law than it does now. At, when we first started, we actually had to submit a curriculum. And so that's tough for unschoolers. So what we ended up having to do was just kind of wing it. You have to list all the subjects that they consider important. And then you have to write how you're going to educate your child on those. So what I would do is I would just, you know, list all the places we might visit or I would list some books that I thought we might use. You have to give the state what they want. Thankfully, by the time he was 13, that law had changed so that we only had to submit a letter of intent and um, that we had to show in our portfolio, um, excuse me, we only had to show in our portfolio progress um, in the so-called so subjects that they wanted to see, beginning, middle, and end of the year. So what, what in the beginning, you know, when I started the journey, naturally I was worried that we weren't going to have enough and they were going to take our right to homeschool away. And I was panicking because I was like, I really want to do radical unschooling totally, but, but I'm, af you know, I'm afraid they'll take our right away because they, they can do that. If, if you don't show progress beginning, middle, and end, then you have to go through this whole process where they can take your right away and you have to, you know, go into an institution, you know, public school, pr traditional school. So I, I think I was more panicky that those first, especially those first two years. And then as time went on and I realized, look, everything we're doing counts for science, for social studies, for art, for, you know, music, for language arts and math and science. I mean, we're covering all of those things. It just doesn't look at all schoolish. And when we, when we hooked up with an evaluator that really got us, that really understood us, then I started to relax and realize, okay, she sees the value in what we're doing, that we're not using textbooks and, and question and answer and essays and all that garbage. And, you know, that we're doing it in a way that, you know, and of course they, the evaluators will tell you what they want to see. So we do have to meet their requirements a little bit, but for the most part, we've been able to just do it our way. They absolutely are. I mean, the interesting thing is that, you know, with, you know, the mainstream understands that every other species is just going to know how to develop innately. You know, you look at the little egg, you know, a chicken's egg, and, and you realize that that chicken is going to know how to hatch. That chicken does not need instruction on, okay, now take your little, you know, egg tooth and push that and knock it and tip it and crack it, and then, then what you want to do is then you want to stick your beak in and you want to start pushing. No, I mean, people realize you don't need to do that. They just know that the chicken is going to know how to hatch and that the chicken is going to innately develop into a full-grown hen or rooster. They, they know that. They understand with the plant that the little plant is going to come up, that they don't have to force the bud open or just keep opening the bud to see how it's doing. They know it's going to innately happen. But for some reason, 
the mainstream does not trust the organic process of the child. There's this, the minute that that child comes out of the womb, it seems like people are trying to force it to do something. They're trying to force it to stand up or force it to say something or, or you know, it's almost like a puppet. And so then as certainly as soon as children get to be about uh, two years old, they immediately start this education process of learning your colors and learning your animals and learning to say your name. Things you can't possibly not learn just by existing. You know, you're going to know your animals pretty quick, no matter what, whether somebody tells you them or not, they're just going to pick it up. Um, it's amazing that when you let children develop, how they will pick these things up. I remember my little nephew, who's now 10 years old, I remember he um, he learned how to spell his name when he wasn't even two years old just because he kept seeing me do it all the time. It wasn't because I said, okay, let's do these letters. And um, so the thing is, is that children, ge let me put it this way, genius is actually very common. It's that we stifle, we suffocate it, we squash it out of children because we don't trust that organic process. You know, when we, if we just allow the organism to develop, whether it's a plant or a bacterium or a virus or a cat or a horse or an elephant or a human being, it, the, the, you know, we will organically develop. It's interesting because um, children learn naturally to read at different le at different ages like there's some children that will learn to read at three years old i was one of those kids i i learned to read at three years old you know i just picked it up there are some children that naturally learn to read at 12 years old well they don't fare well in school when they're expected to read at six and then they're labeled as learning disabled they're learning uh, labeled as disabled when really that part of their brain is not yet ready to turn on until they're 12 the interesting thing is if you leave these children alone, the three and the 12 year old, they'll both read at the exact same level by the time they're an adult. Not, you will not be able to tell which one started earlier and they'll both be equally good readers or, you know. And so um, the problem is, is when a child's forced. You know, my son was forced to start writing when he was in preschool. They were forcing him to sit down and write his letters and they, they, they were forcing the writing at all these ages and by the time I got him when he was in the fifth grade they had literally they were forcing them to write stories and essays and answer questions my son had no interest in writing I remember I tried a little experiment just to see where he was at and I said to him I said Bryson I said let's let's do a little game where we write on a piece of paper anything that comes to your mind that you want to write it can be anything no rules and in, in the next five minutes just to see, because I wanted to see where he was at. This was when he first came. And I remember he wrote on the paper, I don't know, I don't care, this is stupid. And so I realized, wow, we've got a lot of work to do, or work to undo, to detox. And so, <clears throat> so basically this child despised writing. He didn't see a purpose for it. Well, that's because he was 11. Developmentally, he could not see a purpose for writing. It did not affect him. It had nothing, no relevance to his life. And then when he was 14 years old, everything changed. He realized that he had things that he wanted to say that needed to be archived, that he realized that there was a value in the written word, that there were, there were songs he wanted to write, there were stories he wanted to write, that they were too long to just say them and expect them to be heard. And so he started writing this story when he was 14. And he started writing and writing and writing. And then by the time he was 16 and a half, this thing was a full, well actually when he was 15 and a half, it was a full length manuscript and at 16 he started editing it. Now we've been so busy with the music, we, the editing process has been halted, but this is a full length manuscript ready to go to publication as soon as we edit it. And this is from a child who refused to write a sentence. So if we just organically allow children to develop developmentally, these things will, these mechanisms will trigger and turn on when it's relevant to the child. I mean, he saw me writing all the time, so he started to see that there was a value. I think that's the thing with a reading or with math. If the child mo sees you modeling it for them and they see a value in it, you know, some kids might not want to do math until they're literally 17 years old because they realize, wow, I really want to get into that college because I want to do this. Oh, I need four years of math? Okay, well, that, you know, you can do four years of math in, in a very short amount of time. You can do it in just a few hours. You know, you can do it, like, I, I think I read somewhere that 100 hours, you can do, like, an entire 
curriculum of math, 120 hours or something. So if it's internally motivated, it's amazing. Well, you know, as far as my work in the social work and mental health fields, yes, I've, I've been, you know, uh, so many, the majority of the families I work with are just, uh, you know, just uh, emotionally damaged people. They're very traumatized families and they're, they're just barely functioning, some of them. Some of them are outrightly abusive and neglectful. They're outrightly harming, torturing their children. The majority of them, though, are just very, just very disconnected. They're, they're very plugged into the mainstream and they just don't know how to connect to their children, so their children have all these uh, gamut of mental, emotional, and uh, psychological, cognitive, behavioral, and learning problems, challenges. And so I believe that unschooling can work, but I think it, it, it can't just be a, this separate thing. It's not a it's not a thing you do. It's a it's a philosophy. What it, what would need to be is these families need to get back on the human attachment cycle that I talk about in my book. It's a four part mammal. Um, well, it's a cycle. It's the cycle of life. It's not something that mammals sit there and count to four and say, oh, I got to get on the cycle. But it's basically it's the the cycle of mammal life. It's the child has a need, a physical or emotional need, and or in humans, you know, spiritual, social need as well. The child will express the need. The youngest children will cry. The oldest children will will act out or or express with words. Um, the more those needs are ignored, that's when kids start acting out. They're, they're acting out because their their just voice expressions are not being heard or understood. The third step is the parent meets the need immediately or responds in an empathic and validating way if it's something they can't meet immediately to acknowledge the need, respond to it. And then four, the child feels homeostasis, joy, happiness, trust, safety, feels good, and all systems good inside and out. So, um, so in order for these traumatized, damaged, families to be able to unschool, to be able to understand this philosophy of freedom and joy. The family would need to repair the parent-child attachment relationship, the connection. So the way to do that is to get the family back onto that cycle. Child has a need, child expresses the need, the parent learns strategies and skills. This is what I do with my consulting now to find out how to decipher those needs, how to meet those needs, so the child will start feeling for the first time maybe homeostasis and then that will just start naturally cycling. It can take a while though. Once the child starts feeling good, then they're gonna they're they're gonna they're gonna feel good holistically and they're gonna start showing that in their behavior. And so then those conditions are now ripe for you to want to be able to bring in that philosophy. I don't think that you can attachment parent and put your child in public school at the same time. It's some hybrid. It's like a wannabe attachment parent. I don't, you know, I know that might offend attachment parents that put the kids in school, but I'm sorry. Unschooling, homeschooling, at least alternative, at the very least, alternative education is a natural offshoot. You know, to, to, you, you, you can't be attachment parenting if your child's six hours in an institution in a box sitting there doing nothing with none of their physical and emotional needs being met. And then coming home with all this homework, the, everything regimented, that's not, it goes against, you know, nature. So, yes, I do believe families can be repaired, but it takes something different than what our culture offers. If we look to the culture to repair it, we're not going to find it. And it's got to come from within the family. Absolutely. And some of the, and the thing is, is that a lot of times the parents need to be reparented themselves because they have nothing to give. I mean, a lot of the families that I work with, the parents have extreme trauma histories. Some of them have been in foster care. Um, some of them were teen parents themselves. Some of the people I work with, they had their kids when they were 14, you know, so they have nothing to give because they were, they, the reason they had children was to try to meet that unmet need. So, um, so obviously in order to heal the children, you have to heal the parents and the children simultaneously. You know, you, you have to have support doing that. The mainstream supports don't work. Talk therapy, medication, or rather drugging. It's not, it's not medication. It's chemicals. It's chemical restraint. In order to heal these families, you need to use real methods, like brain-based treatments like EMDR, energy work, or homeopathy, you know, dietary changes. You need to use the full gamut. It's a, it's a big piece of the pie. My professional, my professional experience has shown me, you know, by getting out of the professionalism, is that it's a multifaceted treatment that needs to happen. And so, yes, I do believe 
unschooling needs to be part of that repair process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and can be done. But again, it can't, you just can't take a family that's not functioning and say, okay, keep your kids home from school. Because in that moment, the school might actually be a protection, if you can imagine that. And I don't yeah. consider schools to be protections, but if the child is really being neglected or abused, that might be their only, you know, their only break from that. So you have to repair the, the parent-child relationship in conjunction with bringing them into the unschooling lifestyle. You cannot reform a system that was instituted for the sole purpose of creating a subordinate group of people. The whole purpose of public education, contrary to what anybody wants to say, is to indoctrinate children, to inject children with a certain worldview, to get them to take their place in society, whether that's as a cog in the factory, in the mines, or the military. That is how it started. Or now, it's not the factory in the mines, it's the cubicle, you know, or, or the lab, you know, or the desk, um, or the computer, behind the computer somewhere, you know, maybe even if you're working from home, it's still behind the computer. So, um, I actually, I'm exhausted by hearing that word school reform. I mean, I, I, mean, I can't tell you. It's just, it's like a joke. It, 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 to say school reform, it, it's such an oxymoron. It really is. It's, it's like saying a loving death, a loving murder. It's just, <laughs> yeah. it's like saying a willing rape. It, it's, it's, yeah. it's not, um, it, you can't reform a system that is toxic to begin with. It's like trying to take a glass of water that somebody put arsenic or cyanide in and saying we're going to reform the water. You know, we're going to take it out and then you're going to drink the glass. It's like, I'm sorry I'm not touching that. You know, I don't care how much purification, I'm not touching that glass of water. To be honest with you, I like uh, John Taylor Gato's um, vision of what he calls public education. Education that truly is public. Um, he sees um, taking all of the community buildings that we have, everything from public schools, museums, libraries, and community centers, and like science centers and you know history centers, anything you can imagine that we have that's public. And you can even open up the private stuff too, in the private sector if they want to join in. But taking all the public stuff that all the communities have, opening them up to the public, free for people to come and go as they please, and offering real things to the community that the community wants, regardless of age. So you're free to come and go, participate or not participate, as you please. So let's say, let's say a five-year-old child says, I want to run... Um, a workshop on how to make silly bands. So they use the public school to do that. Let's say they use an entire classroom and we're going to deck this classroom out in silly bands. We're going to decorate it and make it our classroom for two weeks because for two weeks we're going we're to agree to meet. All the kids that want to come can come to this. Adults can come. But I'm, I'm going to facilitate this. My name is Laurie and I'm five years old and I'm going to facilitate this group today. And so people can come and go as they please. And let's say <clears throat> Let's say I'm me, I'm Laurie A. Couture, I'm an author, and I'm going to run a workshop on, on writing. People can come and go as they please. Let's say a, a teacher, you know, let's say that, that uh, English teacher that I had, that was, he was so great, he gave me his entire Beatles album collection. Um, let's say he decides he's going to do a workshop on the Beatles. People can come and go as they please. Nobody gets grades. Let's say my son wants to do a workshop on guitar and voice and piano and people can come and explore the instruments like he did yesterday. And he explains how these, these, these instruments work and how the voice works and, he, and then he performs. Let's say other people get the opportunity to perform. Let's say that it morphs into something where, wow, let's go tour a recording studio. Oh my gosh, how do we use a recording studio? Well, gee, he explains to them and he has recorded a CD. And how can we do that now? And then that morphs into a class. Let's say that lasts 16 weeks. Maybe it, they like it so much it lasts three years. But the point is that people can come and go as they please. And because he's a child doesn't mean that he wouldn't have a right to do it. Or the five-year-old, because the five-year-old's a child, doesn't have the right. Or, or let's say, you know, me, because I don't have a teaching degree. So that's the point. Public education is serving the public with what they want.
because the system as it is, the people who are in play, the systems in play, and all the contracts in place, the financial gain, all the contracts, can't make it possible because there are billions of dollars at stake. There are all these companies that sell things to the school. The school is federally you know, there's a federal department of education. There are people who have what they call standards and curriculum. They have certain things they have to meet. The teachers have to be certified and they have to do certain things. So it, there, there's no way to reform that system. You'd have to literally clean it all out. And if the teachers who truly love children want to come back in yeah. and then change their way of interacting with children, and, and do it this way, then that's different. Like, let's say teachers as mentors because they love children, not because they, they get off on telling kids they can't go to the bathroom or can't eat, or they just get off on the fact that they can just punish that kid. Have you ever seen that scene in The Breakfast Club where you have that, that teacher that just goes at it with Bender and just keeps giving him all the detentions? That's another one. That's another one. That teacher is sick. That teacher gets off on that. He gets his jollies off of that. And, and there are teachers that that is why they're there. It's almost like a sexual high they get. You know, I really, you know, I really believe that. They, they get some power and control thing from their past. They didn't have any power and control and they get off on it. And so we can't reform that. Those are the people we need. We need to get rid of those people and then the gems, we sift it. Like they used to sift the gold. Mm -hmm. You know, sift for the diamonds and the gold. You know, the gold, the gems, they can stay, but they need to stop playing school, you know? Yeah, college, um, yeah, higher institute. You know what? The, the, I have two words about that. You're 18 at that point. You can do what you want. Right. If you go to college, you know, and you're sitting, if you go to college and you're sitting in a college, you can get up and leave at any point. You can say, I don't like this. I don't want to be in this class. And you can get up and walk out and leave. You know, my son, my son's a musician, so his main passion is music, and, and he has different ideas about what he wants to do. He, his main thing is he wants to be, be composing and writing the music and gigging and, 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 and sending a message of children's rights to the world. And so he's talked about the idea of maybe taking some classes, but really not sure exactly whether college is right for him. And I told him that I'm absolutely fine with that. I don't, he doesn't need to go into an institution to be happy. If he chooses to do that because he wants to, that's great. But the main thing is, is that if somebody wants to go into college, that's their free will to do it. Public school children, traditional school children, they don't have a right. They're in prison for the crime of being under 18. And in some cases, they're still 18 and even 19, but they're still under the auspices of that, you know, they haven't graduated yet. So there's actually 18 and 19 year old young people who are still being subjected to these same, you know, rules as the other children, but they're now of legal adult age and they don't recognize their adult status in school, you know. Right. <clears throat> well, that the majority of, uh, I have to say, the majority of my consulting phone calls are from people that are unhappy with, you know, the, the ones that aren't already unschooling or, um, they're, the majority of the calls from people who are not already, um, unschooling are calling about getting their children out of the system, getting them out of traditional school, is as I tell them, absolutely go for it. You can do it. The best, the most important thing that you need to do is you need to trust, trust nature's intent for children. You have to allow them to play. You need to hook them up with as many resources as you can. You live your lives. You, if, if they love music, then you expose them to music. If they love art, you expose them to the art. If they love science, you get them out there. You go to nature centers. You go out in the woods together. You take walks together. You, look, you explore animals. Go to an animal rescue center. You find the ways for your child. You just do these things by living. And if you don't know what their interests are because they've been, they, they, they haven't yet detoxed from the system and they've had that killed out of them, then you expose them to things all kinds of things, you know, and, and whatever they express interest in, you follow that. You go like wildfire with that. And then you need to tap in to your local homeschooling. Hopefully you'll find an unschooling community, but if not, tap into your local homeschooling community in your community and online, the online communities. And then you want to archive and document these things because you want to be able to show for yourself how you're, you know, look at how your child's developing. And obviously you'll need that for state requirements. Every state has some requirements. But, you know, it's, it's just so easy to 
to, to do this. All you, you, the biggest part of it, the hardest part of unschooling is for the parent to de-school themselves. It really is, to, to trust nature, to trust nature's intent for children. Mm -hmm. You know, play. Fear comes up, you know, the people get fearful about it. Oh, I could never do that. And uh, most people do that. I've, I remember being in fear. I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, as an unschooling parent, we, we all get, oh my gosh, what if, what, what if my child doesn't get enough of this or enough of that? But if you just trust, the biggest thing is you need to let your children play. They need to play. Turn off the TV and the video games. I know some attachment fa family, you know, attachment parenting and unschooling proponents don't agree with that. I'm telling you, I've done the research, I've been in the system. Turn off the media because that, that is a drug. You know, um, you know, get that out as an option. Get that away. If that's not an option, it's amazing the things. Your, your children need to experience boredom. They need to be able to experience the boredom that will motivate them to these things. My son, I'm lucky, my son never gets bored. I'm like that too. I never get bored. So it's not, it was never hard to understand his passions. You know, he, he loved, he, he had, you know, he loved the, the Lego line called Bionicle. I mean, he, he would spend hours playing with that, and that's math, science, you know, it's, it's so much. And then he learned the history of it, and then that branched off into this, into that, and then he, then he, and then he created a, an actual Bionicle club for three years where it pulled in a peer group, and we're still very close friends with a lot of those kids now. So we, we created social networks based on his interests, mm -hmm. that's great. which is yeah. very cool. So it can be done. It absolutely can be done. You know, if you love your child, if you cherish your child and your child is everything to you, you can make it happen. I am a single parent living on a dollar by dollar income and I make it happen. There's nothing more important in my life than my son. So anybody who says they can't do it, well, then maybe you need to ask yourself, who's your priority? Yourself, your job, or your child? You know? <laughs> awesome. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Absolutely. Yeah.